five square foot parcel in the 10,000 square foot zoning district. And uh, I, I don't want to guess how to pronounce his last name. Um, do you know, Delia, how, how that name's pronounced? Hybeck. It's their name, Hybeck. Okay, these normally go uh, straight to council because he's done the, uh, the checking on the conditions that have to be uh, uh, approved. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Um, so I've set forth all the findings and all the findings can be made. I did have one um, clarification and I was hoping the applicant was gonna be here this evening and that is finding number five concerning impervious surfaces. Um, the, the plans do show that um, uh, there's only 23%, the actual structure only covers 23% uh, of the site. So there's a 30% threshold uh, for impervious surfaces. Um, the architect has represented that in an email that the other hardscape is permeable, either permeable concrete or paving, um, but it doesn't show it on the plans. He had indicated it showed on the plans. I couldn't find it, although I'm not an architect. Um, but there's still 7% impervious left for hardscape. It's probably does meet the standard. It would have to meet the county's zoning regs uh, regarding that. And this, this is a larger parcel than we've seen in a while. Um, it's probably okay, but I would recommend since the applicant's not here, we could add a line in there um, that simply says uh, per the applicant, um, you know, condition it basically per the applicant and per the other hardscape will be uh, permeable concrete or paving. But that's up to the board as to how it would like to handle that. The county won't do that? Well, this is your finding. And so as we know from one other project, sometimes things slip through the cracks with the county. Um, so it's, you know, we could rely on the county enforcing its own rule with regard to that, but um, you could also just add a line in here and I'd be happy to draft one for you um, as the final finding. Do you, do you want a motion to that effect or do you want we wait till the end and See if there are any other changes. Yeah, let's. I would wait till the end. Uh, the position of the house on the property, which is right along Highway One, uh, see, would, would seem to indicate that there'll be a very short driveway, and uh, if it's permeable uh, surface, uh, they'll still be at the twenty-three percent. So do we have any other, any questions about yes, whether the questions. findings are, are confirmed? I have or, questions. Okay. I Let's had a really hard time with some of these reading them. So um, um, on number four, um, so we're saying because it's greater, it doesn't need a certificate of compliance or condition a certificate of compliance or a coastal Correct. development permit. I'm just trying to read the required finding. And so, so just to help you, these are the standard findings you see. These are the information that I add every time is the the actual finding, but the required findings and the information there and the information required are standard. Okay. It comes from our district code and it's standard in every finding that you see. Um, so if that helps you at all. So is we it, it doesn't need their certificates because it's- Exceeds, it exceeds, exceeds the minimum. The minimum, okay. that's correct. But it has one anyway. All right, and then for number six, it's saying that because it's more than 60% of the minimum parcel size, we, we aren't gonna put the two bedroom limit on it. That's correct. 
And then number eight, um, about the offer to buy the adjacent lots, all that we have to show that he did it is um, something that showed he mailed something. There's nothing that actually shows he made an offer on the adjacent lots. There was a, Delia, if you recall. Came in a, after the packet was yeah. produced, yeah. So we did get that late. There was an offer provided. And, yeah. and broad, broad, broadly speaking to that issue, Barbara, this is one of the more problematic sections of the, the variance. It's, it's like, what proof do we require? Does he have to get a response from the people? It's kind of a strange one. It's almost, it's almost like the impervious surfaces. That one's a little quirky as well, but it's, it's just, it's a difficult thing. We don't have, we don't have standard specifications, if you will, that says you have to do this and send a letter certified and get a response. And if the neighbors ignore him, we'll never know. And if they don't respond or do respond, we'll never know. But we still have to make the finding as a body that right. he did this. But, but well, Dean said it he, came he in made the minimum that we got it. I know. I, I was all. talking more to the general point that Chuck was making yeah. that that we don't know, but we are still expected to make the finding, and um, Delia has that documentation. Fine. Yeah, he but submitted an is, actual. He submitted an actual offer, you know, on a car form, real estate car form, and and it was rejected. So we have that. This is actually more. This was the one, right, Delia, that had the car form, right? So. Um, we actually have more evidence in this case than as Chuck pointed out than we normally do. All right. I was just reading through and it seemed to me that proof of mailing something wasn't proof. So thank you. That's all my questions. Okay. Yeah, that uh, can be a difficult one. And nearby, there are many lots owned by the same people or the same trust, and they're going to refuse to sell to themselves. To, to make anything legal. So uh, that, <clears throat> that's another thing we'll have to uh, grapple with. Director Marsh. Uh, Matthew, just to your point about the driveway and impervious surfaces, as I'm looking at the plan, the picture of the house on page A0.0 .0 shows the driveway sweeping across in front of the house. And then when I go a couple pages down to A1.1, I'm actually not sure from that point if the driveway is going to come out on medio as opposed to coming out straight on Highway 1. So if it comes out on medio, which wouldn't surprise me, um, then it is quite a long driveway. So I think I just would support Bill adding a line because we can't see where the driveway is to say it basically we approve contingent on them meeting the standard for the coverage of impervious services or whatever, however Bill said it. That's a good yeah, idea. I would I would agree with that. I mean the other thing I'd point out is this is not a full this is not a full set of plans. So it's possible they've already committed to that. We just don't have the sheets, but I think we should require that. When I when I looked at it I thought about the fact that it's difficult to get Caltrans to give you a permit to put a uh, private <laughs> private house driveway directly onto a highway. But as you look at the north end of this L-shaped property, uh, it's got that weird curve in it. And uh, that's got to be because that's either also Caltrans property or county property. So either way, they have to have a permit to uh, cross to an existing road. Yeah, the curve on, at the very left side is, is Medio Avenue. Uh, the boundary survey exhibit doesn't seem to show that it extends all the way to Medio, though. It may, it may ex expend, extend that far on the ground, but it doesn't in the uh, shows where it's owned. So that that curves the sweep for traffic. That's a traffic engineering thing. Right. Yeah. So, Bill, would you like to? 
Uh, would you reiterate the uh, additions that you would put on this before we ha have a motion? So I would, um, I would add to the end of the finding on finding five, simply that the um, applicant's uh, architect has represented that um, all other hardscape is either is permeable paving or um, um, permeable concrete and um, therefore the board conditions this um, approval on uh, per, on there being permeable paving uh, or concrete for um, for all additional hardscape. Okay, understood. We have a motion. I'll move to approve with that condition. And do we have a second? Second. I'll second. Oh, good. Let David second. <laughs> Any other discussion? All right, let's uh, call the question, please. Okay, uh, Director Dye? Yes. Director Marsh? Aye. Director Clark? Aye. Director Seaton? Aye. And Director Sukamel? Aye. Okay, motion passes five to zero. Okay. Item number two, report on lease agreement with Picasso Preschool. Uh, okay, I, I put this on the agenda, Matthew, for a, a couple reasons. One, I'd like to have an administrative record of uh, you know any leases we enter into and whatnot, and and then obviously just simply for your board's uh, you know knowledge and whatnot. So. Um, Bill had drafted up the lease, sent it to um, Candace at Picasso. We made a few minor um, uh, not corrections, but additions, not the least of which we incorporated the fact that they have a pet skink. <laughs> so <laughs> there are pets allowed. <laughs> I actually thought it was a misspelling. I thought they had a skunk, which would have been worse, but <laughs> there's indeed such a thing as a skink, as I'm sure most of you know. So. I did not know his that. Name, his name his name is Reynolds. There you go. <laughs> Reynolds the skink. So <laughs> uh, be a good band name. <laughs> what is the skink? I have no idea. It's a lizard type thing. Oh. <laughs> I had to look it up. <laughs> so we're all over Australia. It must have come with the eucalyptus trees. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, it's just for your board's information. Like I said, I like to have an administrative record, so we don't need any approval by your board. We had already discussed this in closed session and whatnot, but it's kind of a district transparency issue. So does anyone have any questions or comments on it? The only question I have is we took, uh, the district took possession in the, at the end of July and did has the uh, proprietor paid August rent. And if so, was it the old rent or the new rent? So they're paying, they're paying the new rent and they're paying August. And I gave them, um, she requested to pay it over time. So I, I said she could pay $500 a month for the, the because we we're in a straddle period between the old lease and the new lease. And so she's paying us $5,500 a month for the next uh, 10 or 12 months. Instead of, the, instead of the 5,000 there. So she's paying it. It's kind of a term thing. So she's paying the new rate for August as well as September. And she's paying the August rent over a period of 10 months at $500. So we'll be receiving instead of 5,000, we'll be receiving 5,500 until June of next year. I think that's very good of us, and uh, let's do it. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was trying to work with our rate payers, and you know, Bill pointed out, Chuck, that's not in the lease, and I was like, all right. <laughs> if I get fired over that one, I get fired over that one. <laughs> so, uh, do you have uh, her agreement to that, or and our agreement to that in writing somehow? No, we just have, I have it in email for what that's worth. Yeah. Well, that's writing. 
Um, and I've, uh, I've also been pursuing financing um, for that property. And we had a financial package in place and they, they got it to me last Wednesday. And it, it, it's not as straightforward as I thought. So I was gonna have it on the agenda. So it was basically, I was gonna present to your board a your option of you could keep it as cash obviously, or you could do a 15 year loan or a 20 year loan. So you, you all will see that at our next uh, board meeting, that option. And, and basically, Nancy, maybe some of the stuff you, you've asked about. So the payment would either be, if we took out a loan, your board decided on that, the payment would be $117,000 for a 20-year loan and $147,000 for a 15-year loan per year. So we have all that paperwork in place, but Bill's going to have to take a look at it because it's not a straightforward loan. It's a it's a lease and a lease back and things like that. So it got a little quirkier and more complicated than I thought. And, and, and who and, is who is making the loan? Um, it's so it's Brandis Tallman is the the company we used um, to do some financing in the past. And I actually just used them for my solar loan down in my Whispering Palms district, uh, 1.38 million. So they go and solicit various banks and get the best rate for us and then put it into place. And I can't remember the name of the bank they got. So, but they're, they're the, they're the middleman. And they, you know, they do, they do really good work. I felt bad because she asked me two, three weeks ago, she asked me what the agenda deadline was. And I told her it was two days from the day of my email. <laughs> she panicked and, and I, I tortured her for about a couple hours. And I said, no, <laughs> but, but these people are, all the finance people are good. They get stuff done quickly. So. Chuck, do they, would they also be a source for us when we uh, get to looking at construction loans? Absolutely. Yeah. And we got, we got good, we got, I can't remember the exact rate, Nancy, I want to say it's 2.34% or something, 2.4, something like that, really low. Yeah, so money, yeah, as we all know, money's cheap. Money's cheap right now. Okay, is that all on this? That's it. Okay, item three, report on parks and recreation activities. This can start. Isn't here, why we traveling? Um, uh, just finishing up the uh, the recreation program for the summer. Barbara and I uh, both led history walks on Saturday. We had over about twenty five people um, come, and we split them in two groups and gave them a, a good hour and a half or a little bit more tour of El Granada and its wonderful history, um, which was a really good showing. And I've probably had five or six people tell me since then that they, oh, they wanted to come and they missed it or they forgot to show up. So it's one I think we'll probably repeat periodically. Um, the movie, the ET, is in Torrey Park on Saturday night at 7.30. The Coastside Mountain Bikers are doing a, a biking demonstration from 7 to 7.20. Movie slated to start at 7.30. Uh, again, we're closing off the parking lot for disabled parking and encouraging people to walk or bike and bring a chair. And um, we have, I just looked yesterday, we were approaching 160 people having signed up. I think we did a better job this time of putting the Eventbrite information out there. So as of yesterday, we had 158 or 160 people sign up. Uh, last time, about 50% showed, so I think it just depends on how cold it is on Saturday evening. Um, uh, that tends to affect the turnout. I know I've uh, opted out when I've signed up because it's cold, but it should be, it's starting more than an hour earlier than our last movie, so we're hoping that more of those people show up because we'll be running so late. Um, Michelle put in a ton of work exploring, talking to bands, talking about stages, talking about hay bales, talking about porta potties, at potentially um, setting up a concert on the um, Burnham Strip. Where we have got to is, um, she does have a contact, uh, Joe Flambeau, I think it's Joe Deuce, he goes by Joe Flambeau, 
who's helping with what it would take to stage it, including to avoid having fuel and a generator uh, exploring. And Delia is, is helping him explore whether we could drop power from PG&E. Uh, but his, uh, he and Delia came to the view that it was worth exploring that, but probably not pushing it at this point in time. And note, Half Moon Bay Parks and Rec um, canceled their upcoming concerts in the park and concerts at MacDutra because of the, the surge in the Delta variant in the, in the pandemic. So we're looking at maybe next spring, um, maybe if we get to having some kind of ceremonial um, groundbreaking for the park, uh, we could build a community event around it, but um, that's where we are with potential uh, music. The next PAC meeting is in November and Pat is really looking for help and ideas on what we might want to put on PAC's agenda or have them get involved with um, because of the pandemic and so little recreation for them to get involved with and manage and not having a recreation coordinator to support them doing that. They haven't had a whole lot to do this year also because we, we didn't have a need for um, so much community outreach for projects this year. So they are looking for kind of what is their, their reason to be over the next year. And he would love to have ideas if people um, think of things for him. I think that's all I have. Go ahead, Barbara. Well, I just had an idea that I thought I'd run by everyone for um, discussion, not for decision. Um, seems as if the walks do okay. And I was thinking that we could start running a monthly walk on the second Saturday of every month. Uh, we've done a nature walk and a history walk and some other walks have been done in the past. Our esteemed chair said he might be willing to do an archeology span walk. Uh, I know I think there's some people that I, I did, a, I think a couple of years ago, we did a birding walk and I think I could find a volunteer to lead that again. But they're pretty easy uh, to do. You just need to find a couple of people to lead them. Now we were thinking that at Christmas time and anyone's watching, it would be fun to have a uh, holiday music walk where people would just gather and get some people to lead and maybe some music and walk around and sing some holiday songs. I think it could be fun and fairly easy and I've organized those before. So it's something I thought I might work on. I will say also that um, the office purchased for us little microphones that you wear in your head and, and you have a little clip and that helps in terms of being able to have a group that doesn't have to stay close because you're speaking more loudly and it's getting out there. So that helps with issues around um, closeness and so forth. And I didn't wear a mask when I was talking been triple vaccinated now I qualified and um but people people most, some of the people chose to wear masks and some didn't but people were spaced apart a bit so it, it did not feel as if it as as close as it might be for some other events so do people think this might be something we want does anyone have any objection to us looking into doing something like this there you go so we'll look at it and bring it back for consideration and Nancy did a great walk. And the cool thing is she had arranged, she met the guy who lives in the, um, the train station that's rolled up to the top of Portola. And so he was in my group and he had lots of tails and, and you can see where the ticket window was in the front of his house and he brought out some pictures. So it was just a really enjoyable day of walking around El Granada and looking at cool stuff. So we can do another one of those maybe <coughs> in January. So. I did a practice walk with some of my family on the Labor Day weekend. And when I was standing out on the median in front of his house talking about it, he came out and he invited us in and gave yeah. us a tour of the inside of the house and pointed out <laughs> various details. He's a character. Um, but uh, Are you talking about Jim? Jim. Yeah. Yeah. That's the house that's near uh, uh, the Alameda and Portola. Exactly. Right. And the, actually the barn um, behind it on the Alameda has, uh, a, a, is redwood inside and has evidence of horses having been in there because you know they rub, they rub off the two by fours. So it's, it's not sure if it's the same age as the house, but it's, it's, it's horse and buggy vintage. He has the oldest building in El Granada actually. Yeah. And the palm in front was planted by the uh, 
project. A shoreline investment. Yeah. And he mentioned that it was moved as well, right? Yeah. The rolled, building was moved. Yeah. Rolled on logs. Up yeah. The way. It's so cool. The history of this place is great. When we have our, our community center, we're, we, I think it would be great to have a little museum. There is um, a, a woman who did, uh, when there was a TV station, um, before it was absorbed into PC uh, TV, who, after Barbara Vanderwerf uh, published her book, uh, did a documentary. And there was a, a man on my walk who was familiar with that, who was just sure that either Barbara Vanderwerf may still have a copy of it, or the woman who uh, used to run the TV station may have a copy of it. So we'll be working our contacts to see if we can get that, because that would be another cool thing to put a link on our website to watch it. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Okay, and then Matthew, just let me report. I had a, uh, I know we talked about this briefly before, but I had a meeting today, a Zoom meeting with Tom Conroy from uh, K and K, and Jonathan Tang and Brian from BKF Civil Engineering. So we talked about the next steps. They're coordinating all their their work together. The civil guys are going to take uh, Tom's rough grading plan, if you will, and take it from, you know, I'll go hyperbole to from 100 foot contours to two foot contours and get things moving. And I also uh, I, I had contacted maybe a week and a half ago, uh, a woman from Dudek, who I thought could help prosecute and actually manage the park project. It turns out she is retired. So that's why she didn't get back to me. <laughs> so uh, I, I reached out to the head of our environmental group, and we've got, I actually don't even know what offices we have up there in Dudek, but I think there's a Santa Cruz one, and there's some scattered about the Bay Area. So I, I wanted to see if there's anyone who could, you know, project manage, um, you know, that project. So, you know, because I, I just get, I get pulled in too many other directions, mostly sewer. So, um, you know, I think the project needs it, and it'd be really good. So. Well, they could take that and the community center because I think there's no reason why we shouldn't. Start the whole thing, yeah. The whole, the whole stuff the community yeah, center. Yeah, and I and I, I spoke to Tom and 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 uh, Jonathan Tang about incorporating all that stuff as well. And certainly, if any of you are in the business, you know, I know Eric, you're in, you're somehow related to the civil engineering business there. If you guys have any project managers, park stuff. You know, I'm picking Dudek because I know Dudek and we'll find out. But if you got anybody else, certainly, you know, we're open to it. Dudek has an Oakland office. Right. Like I said, they have offices I don't even know about. <laughs> 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 we're a little bigger than the 35 people that were there when I joined. <laughs> so. so that's all I got, Matthew. Okay. Thank you. Item number four is uh, consideration of amending district ethics policy to add a provision for censure. And I did ask that, that this be put on the agenda. Um, this partly came out of my search for the uh, code of ethics that we adopted just March of this year. And I ha had assumed it was, it uh, became part of another set of documents, the bylaws or the or ordinance code, but in fact, it's a standalone document. And uh, so uh, Delia sent me a copy and uh, I guess my only point is that we adopted this uh, code of ethics with no uh, force. There's no uh, um, way to, to uh, um, make, uh, urge people uh, more strongly to abide by the code of ethics. It's so, no consequence for not abiding. No consequences, right, for not abiding. And uh, so I think we, you know, it's a two sentence um, addition that we would make that uh, basically says that people who violate the ethics code, uh, there will be uh, possibly censure or for advisory committee. Uh, uh, people could be dismissed from, from that committee. And uh, so I would ask for opinions. And I, I, I really think that uh, 
well, a code of ethics without a uh, um, enforcement uh, policy is uh, rather useless. So um, what do people think? I think it was an oversight to not have it. I agree that any sort of policy that says this is what's expected should have something with it that says, and here's what happens if the expectations don't happen. This actually came, um, when Matthew brought that up, I reached out to someone I know at the Harbor District and um, uh, she sent me their similar policy. And th these two lines are, are the two lines that they have in their policy. What, what are the two lines? They're in blue on, doesn't have a page number. Any representative found to be in violation of this code may be subject to censure by the district board. Any member of any advisory committee found in violation may be subject to dismissal from the committee. It's on page 65 of the PDF. It's the only thing's on the page. Um, I mean, I don't have any problem with it. I would hope that we can all act like grown-ups and we'll never need to use it. Oh. So yeah, I mean, my, my thoughts is I find it kind of ironic. It doesn't mention anything to do with the Brown Act, which governs local boards and carries fines and imprisonment because this came about from a board meeting where two different board members started talking about things in closed session. And it's interesting because not only was that raised with multiple people, but nothing's been done. There's been no reprimand of an actual law that's in place that actually has serious repercussions for being violated. And so it's kind of interesting that there's even this mention of censure, the, 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 the idea of trying to silence a, a board member, whether it's for making good arguments or just being an outside four to one vote. I, I think it's preposterous that we would be spending time on creating these new laws where there's serious California laws in place where I've raised it to a truck and he knows about it and hasn't done one thing I don't think I haven't seen in terms of reprimanding anyone or actually saying, hey guys, you can't talk about board votes, things in private session and open session. And it happened twice during that meeting. And it's very upsetting when somebody talks about something in closed session and you can't respond without violating the Brown Act. So you are already being censured and you could see the frustration if two different board members are gonna be talking about things in closed session, in open session as part of an argument and you can't really respond because you're violating Brown Act. So I would say our focus should be on saying, wait a second, guys, let's do a better job as a board of everyone understanding when there are Brown Act violations and, and cut back on those. And when there are emails go out to everybody saying, hey, this was a potential Brown Act violation. Do not talk about private closed session board meeting. What, what goes behind in closed session until the right time comes out. And it's funny that we're talking about censure and things like that, um, you know, when, you know, when, when there's other bigger things that I think we should be spending our time on instead of creating our own, you know, local enforcement and things like that when there's already lots of ethic statutes and, and requirements and trainings and everything else in place. And, uh, and so I think if you look at the, where this stems from, from one meeting that they get heated and an important topic, spending 1.8 million on a building, which some people would say there's some legitimate arguments to, to be highly passionate about an argument. And so if you take that from, if anyone in California is listening and you go back to a couple meeting where this stems from and you're saying, wait a second, two other board members had Brown Act violations. This is uh, an important topic buying a building, and this is the this is this is what comes out of that. Instead of instead of something addressing some of those Brown Act issues, or, you know, or, or so many other things. So I just kind of find that part of it ironic. Um, so that, that's my thoughts on that. If I just mention as the secretary for the district board, I do not know what. Um, Director Steaton is talking about in terms of a 
closed session vote because I had no record of any vote being taken in that particular closed session. So um, it, it was something Eric said. Eric said I was the only one that voted this way. But there was no vote. Closed closed session vote yeah, and I'm just saying, I don't, and mischaracterizing okay. what my vote this, was. This is part of the problem. I to respond to. Director is just may, may, may I? May I? Re yeah. Since since I was called out by name, I'm going to respond and set the record straight. David, I pointed out the vote you made in open session, not closed session. If you don't like it, you can go back and look at the meeting minutes for that meeting, and you will see that it was a open session vote. Okay, I was talking about uh, <laughs> what my vote was, and we, we can go back. And you were talking clearly about what the final vote was because <laughs> otherwise you're just being using misinformation why does it matter what we go to to go into closed session that's an irrelevant vote that's to look at information that i haven't seen before the actual vote that matters is the vote that matters so you mischaracterized it <laughs> not only did you talk about a closed session thing but you purposely did that to mischaracterize it and then nancy same thing same meeting she starts talking about I, i'm making i'm talking about something in my own words and she's saying i can't use that you start you you said that in closed session you can't talk start talking about what other people said in, in closed session you know people have the right to as a board member to say to have their opinions in closed session and rephrase them in different ways and the way you can't do is talk about what somebody else said in, in closed session, open session. So I'm saying if anyone in California is listening to a little board trying to create their own policies when there's so many ethic, ethical standards out there, I would say big picture. Let's focus on doing a good job with complying what's out there. And once we do a good job complying what's out there, then we could broaden the spectrum and and, and and go from there. But I would say if there's all these violations and still nothing's been done, like I said, to me, that's a bigger frustration. I expected one email coming from, from Chuck or legal saying, hey guys, you know, I mean, this, you, you can't be doing that. You, you cannot be coming to that line at all. And, uh, and there's still been nothing. So I find it interesting that, you know, and and even other things that this is even on the agenda where I've, I've asked so many times, how many meetings in a row do I need to ask for a topic on considerations of the continuum of consolidation? I, I mean, I've asked it for like maybe the last year. All right, and, uh, all right, Director Seaton, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut you off now. That's, you're far off the topic. And allow me to say that the staff was well aware of your accusations of Brown Act violations and unanimously they pointed out there were no votes during the closed section session and uh and it's just been repeated and you can not only look at the minutes you can go back and watch the entire meeting and um well you can't watch the closed session there, the, 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 there were, the vote to buy real no, estate wasn't in closed well, session there were no votes taken in closed session therefore you, your accusation was a uh a chimera, it doesn't exist. Chuck or Bill, can you confirm that there was no close on voting on Dubai Real Estate in closed session? Yeah, David, I'm not I'm not legal counsel, obviously, nor would I be calling out a board member for an alleged violation or violation of the Brown Act. What I generally try and do is if we're starting to skirt issues with the Brown Act, I tell the board, hey, I think we got to stick to this at the Brown Act. I read both your emails. I was at the meeting. I didn't see any Brown Act violations. And the, like they said, the vote was taken in open session. If I had seen something that I would have raised the issue and I didn't see anything. I don't think Eric said anything out of bounds. I don't think Nancy said anything out of bounds. And yeah, that's, that, that's just where I'm at. So. Okay. And I think you guys are mischaracterizing. There was a vote to go into closed session to point you as a negotiator but there was a vote in closed session that took place to actually buy the real estate. So you guys are mischaracterizing that. And if you guys want to do that on public TV, that's fine. Because if anyone's watching, you go back and you guys will see that there was a vote in open session to, to appoint you as a negotiator and then a closed session vote that took place in closed session. Well, let's not, David, let's not talk about 
votes that were taken in closed session because that is a violation of the Brown. Okay, Act. I'm not talking. I'm talking about the facts of what happened. I'm not talking about. I'm not re repeating anything. I'm saying if something happened, I'm repeating what Eric happened already on public footage. So you know, so and and Bill, if you could confirm, was there ever a vote taken in closed session to buy real estate? I was not at that meeting. It was the one meeting I missed. So. Okay. I can't speak to it. And uh, uh, well, you know, there, there, there was, there absolutely was. And, but again, uh, we shouldn't be talking, discussing votes that were taken in closed session because- Well, it, what and, I'm saying is there already- was wasn't it reported out from the closed session? Wasn't it reported out from the closed session? Then it would be an open session item and could be discussed. I don't remember exactly. I don't have my notes in front of me, but at any rate, this, this, this policy, I think you feel it targets you, David. It's a generic policy. It's the same policy that many other districts have. It's just a simple thing, you know, puts teeth into the ethics code of the district. Yeah, yeah I just find it ironic, like I said, when there's uh, when there's violations of Brown Act, like I said, and Nancy you're, trying to you're, you're argue talking, with me you're saying, talking that, about two different things. saying that I can't say, saying you that you said that in two session. Things and so that all took place in that meeting. And, and you it was were saying important. the same thing over and over again, and no one agrees with you. So, um, and that's a lot. Oh, and and, the, and that I, is, I believe that you've also uh, uh, compared uh, what happened, what you say happened with being censored. Censorship is not what we're talking about. We're talking about censure, two different words, and that that's the uh, the sum total of. Uh, the meaning of, of and, and 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 that's and and that's my very problem with it is because when you are a four one board, a lot of times on votes and you are that outsider, you absolutely do. I feel this targeting absolutely it it is in in, in that sense, and I think that you have to be careful because all of a sudden, yeah, even though it's 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 there there aren't consequences obviously because there can't be, but the fact that you're going down that line to, to silence, punish, cancel somebody, in, so to speak, for, for arguing different point of views. It, I repeat, it, it, to, to me, it should I be encouraged. Repeat, it should be encouraged. The dissent should be encouraged. With censure. I watched, I watched the, entire the entire meeting again. It was painful, but I watched the entire meeting. You had the floor more than just about everyone else combined. And so uh, I'm not. And, and that's what I'm this is about. Exactly. So I had the floor and you have a problem that, with that. that, that and you're you trying to change silent. that. And you're you trying not, to change that now. You were not silent. And, and so that's what this is about. It was about that I had the floor that night. And that's what I'm saying. That was my point. I got you to say it, that this is about me having the floor and, and arguing. And this is you trying to say, I'll show him. Yeah, board members. So yeah, and to, to reiterate really Matthew's point, the, the issue here is not to put a chilling effect on discussion or whatnot. The issue here is to continue our sense of decorum, hopefully, and prosecute these conversations in a, a polite way with everyone involved. So as I regretted saying, we don't turn into another local district. So... Okay, so that's I what agree this is about. that this is a very mild uh, change. It just adds something to the policy. I don't think its purpose is to censor anyone. It's to 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 encourage um, courtesy and and respect. It's not directed at any single person. And I move approval of the change. A second. Do we have any? Uh... New discussion. All right, let's let's do the roll call, please. Okay, uh, Director Die. Yes. Director Marsh. Yes. Director Clark. Aye. Director Sukamel. Aye. Director Seaton. Abstain. Okay, motion passes four zero one with Director Seaton abstaining. Can I no. ask a, a, a question? Was the vote on the purchase of the building a public vote at some point? 
Uh, yeah, I, yeah, so, yeah. I don't I, I, I don't have my notes in front of me, Barbara, the purchase of the building, if it was not. Uh, a, I think Bill wants to talk. Maybe we oh, should let sorry, him yeah. talk before so, we say anything else. Thank you, Eric. So I, I don't recall, um, you know, whether the vote was done in closed session or open session, but what, just so you understand when you, when you direct your negotiator to do a deal um, unless the other side has already signed the agreement and you're voting in closed session to accept that agreement, that is not a reportable action until the other side then signs it. And then if someone requests the agreement, you have to produce it. So just wanna be clear, there's no violation of the Brown Act if the board directed the real property negotiator to go forward with an offer um, and it's not accepted and it wasn't reported out yet. So um, I seem to believe that we did not have a consummated um, purchase agreement at the time the board gave direction. That vote um, going from memory may have been done in closed session, may not have been done in closed session, but it would not have been a problem if it were in closed session because the action we, the board took was not final. Well, it, well, there's a difference too. You can vote on these things in closed session. The question is, is whether it's a reportable action when you come out of closed session. And if the other side hasn't yet signed the agreement, it's not yet reportable. Yeah. Okay. I hope that helps clarify something. Okay. okay. Item Number five. Did we vote? No, we already. We oh, we already did. Voted. I'm sorry. We did. Yeah. Uh, report on sewer authority mid coast side meeting. Barbara. <laughs> well, the sewer authority is still very much caught up with um, the upset at the plant, whatever the cause is, and actions to be taken to deal with it. Uh, the history of the pr program, which has lots of initials, the NW. It's called the non-domestic program. <laughs> it's yeah, easier. Non-domestic <laughs> program, I've been calling it the program, which was approved in 1994. Well, it was approved in 91 and then approved again in 94. It is evidently to have a program of this kind is a condition of Sam's permit. It was in place in some form or another until 2014 when for no known reason, it was stopped and no longer happened. The idea is that uh, businesses that have the potential to, well, we're gonna put something other than domestic wastewater into the system, get this permit. And so that, that Sam knows who they are and where they are and has the, the potential, the possibility to regulate them if issues come up. Um, as most of you know, their first take at this was to select eight businesses, six of which were in our district, and ask them to sign a, a an agreement that said they would pay all costs with nothing. <laughs> you know, at that point, Sam had spent $600,000 and, you know, it could have been, they could have been $100,000 each for all they knew. And, and gave them a deadline. Uh, they still have not finalized this, but we are hoping that in the next week, I mean, everybody's backed off that and understands. And actually Sam held a very good workshop with all these businesses and talked to them about what they're trying to accomplish. I wanna second what Chuck said that these, the people running these ones in, you know, I don't know about the Half Moon Bay ones, but the ones in our district are all environmentalists. They all wanna do the right thing. They've all been working with Sam all along and so forth. So, you know, hopefully people will come together in the next couple of weeks to come up with a program that works and um, spell out some of the things that so far aren't spelled out, which is you know, what, what the costs of this would be, what the requirements would be, and if there's any phasing, so difference in requirements for different kinds of business, that would need to be spelled out and so forth. So it's complicated. Um, 
there are differences of opinion among the agencies uh, about how it's going to be. Um, I was told not to say implemented because theoretically it was implemented before and it hasn't gone away, but it really has gone away. It needs to be re-implemented if it's going to be in place. And how much is needed and how much, how big is the problem? And of course, the bottom line is that an awful lot of money has already been spent. And, and sorry to interrupt, Barbara. It's okay. It, it, is there a problem with right. storage control? Right. Yeah, yeah. But the, the question of whether there really is a problem has not really been adequately looked at. And at this point, I'm just right, puzzled right. as how to, how, as, as, how to have a proper evaluation of that problem. And so, uh, stay tuned. Yeah, so, yeah, so I think we need, we need a non-domestic source program. Yes. Just because I think it's it's good practice, it's best management practices in, in, in our industry. I don't think there is a BOD problem, you know, with these sourcings, as I've said many times before. Certainly, if no other reason, you know, now that the regional board's involved, you know, we're going to have one in any in, in any event. But I'm 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 going to beat a dead horse, maybe. But I'm going to give you the 15 second. <laughs> overview of this issue. Plant ran fine for 15 years. They had a bad two and a half weeks in October and November of last year. It ran fine for another eight months. They switched aeration basins in late June. They had some filamentous bulking problems, which caused a couple more issues. And since then, I believe they've resolved that and the plant is running fine again. So this is not, this is not a giant issue you know, people keep using the plant upset like it's been upset for eight months. It's been a bad two and a half weeks and a bad three weeks in June, July, and, but, you know, which had a cause. And so, but I, the outcome we're looking for, I think, is to work together with the other two agencies and with Sam to come to a common program, maybe run by someone like Mark Thomas, who's an outside consultant. We all agree on what we're looking for. It's educational with some testing if we need that kind of thing, we all agree on it. So that's kind of what I'm hoping as the outcome. And, you know, Sam has in the JPA <clears throat> the ability and maybe the responsibility to run this program. So we want to work with them to, to move it forward. The other part that's a little tricky is that uh, evidently Sam was running this program and someone was interacting with the county and maybe Delia can speak to that. but. When a business, you know, they keep talking about new businesses and when did we issue the sewer permit, but a lot of cases are not new. It's not a new building. It's not a new facility. It's a change in use um, of a facility. And so GCSD at this point doesn't really know when that happens. And in fact, for several of these businesses, the, the water and sewer is connected to the building, not to the particular tenants of the building. And so the commercial use permit is for the whole building. So if one of the spaces in there changes, uh, we don't necessarily know. I know Delia watches that, uh, but it seems like we probably need a system uh, to work with the county to understand uh, where the businesses are that need to be in this. And if I got that wrong, Delia, can you correct me? Is that a fair summary of well, the county hasn't been very consistent um, providing us with that information automatically, although um, I've gotten a couple of bits of information from them via the referral process. Um, but I never know if it, they're finalized or what happens to it because we're not issuing a sewer permit. Um, I don't follow the county approvals and know whether that business was actually, or that use change was actually established. I have no way of knowing. Um, at one time, uh, Sam, the employee over at Sam, when they were running the non-domestic waste source control program, they had a connection at the county and they got that information directly from the county. Now, it's likely we can secure that kind of relationship again, whether it be Sam or us. Um, it's just not something that I've, had to pursue. I, I don't know who to talk to over there, but probably somebody at planning and building we could ask 
for them to provide, you know, forward us that information as it comes in. I can't guarantee we'll get it, but we can ask for it. And this, and and this is a not a, a firm um, doing it. We, we could ask, the, give them that responsibility. Well, so and, this is solvable. Yeah. And let me follow up on that because Delia wasn't a party to these things. This was not a, a new issue with the county referral process. And it was interesting. I was talking to, at the manager's meeting with Clemens and John Doughty. And, you know, John pointed out, which I hadn't thought about, they're in a unique position because they permit all the businesses in the city of Hackman Bay as well as issue sewer permits. But Jonathan Whitwer and I had sat down with the county twice, Steve Monowitz and maybe John Brennan and a, 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 a one of the their lawyers and talked about this like, hey, we're not, this is all before BOD was even discussed. It's kind of, hey, we're not getting this stuff, you know. You, you know, you you're, you could put a laundromat in an office space, and we we need to know about this kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, it, it's been a it's a it's been a long term issue, but once again, I don't you know. It doesn't happen very often. It doesn't so. happen very often. The impact on Sam isn't very great, quite honestly, from the. Brewery. So we're hoping. My hope is that in the next couple of weeks, we'll have a, a consensus on a program that will have clear parameters and will be fair to the businesses who will be affected by it. So that's my hope. Certainly within the next month and a half, you're right. Yeah. And so if, we have, if we hire a separate consultant to do it for our district, I would certainly think that, that uh, one of the provisions would be that they check uh, monthly uh, with the county about uh, changes in use. Yeah. Yeah, and this and then, isn't unique. This happens down in San Diego County as well. We, like Delia says, we get referrals sometimes and then sometimes we don't. And I've never figured out what sets that off, quite honestly. And then let me just throw out one other issue that's going on, which is that Sam is overspent, was over budget by $700,000 in the 2021 fiscal year. And at our next meeting, we're going to be looking at those numbers and um, Sam has has had a surplus because of the capital improvement projects that you know they mm -hmm. tend to take longer than expected. And they set, they set the contract in the year that it's approved to do the project, but often the work ends up partly being done the next year. And so we're going to ha have a new report on all of the projects and how they're proceeding. And so that will be a step forward. So some some hopefully good some good financial things will be coming um, to the board at the next meeting. I, I would like to be able to provide a little more clarity, but uh, that doesn't appear to be possible. Um, and I can't think of a word to describe what's going on at Sam with and the uh, uh, non domestic program, because, uh, well, in the last meeting, the staff report said the program was halted in 2014. But in fact, um, they have been collecting fees and spending money uh, as shown in the budget on the expenses for uh, non-domestic permitting. Um, so uh, I, the best word I thought of was it, it's going to be reactivated. It, it oh, can't be re-implemented because it's never gone away. But it's going to be reactivated. reactivated. I like and, it. Thank you, uh, Matthew. That's that's, that's what we're uh, uh, struggling with is the uh, how how that will happen, and it will come this to this board for discussion. And and uh, uh, Chuck, I'm sure, will by then have the perfect solution. And it will come to well, this why. board. <laughs> it will come to this board for review and approval. Correct. Yeah. I tried, I tried to moderate Barbara's optimism in the, the two week thing because <laughs> I, you're, now I feel like weeks. we're state legislature, something pops up and they, <laughs> let's have a little thought process. This is a long-term program. So, <laughs> and again, that was silly. That was just wishful thinking, but, I know. but hopefully <laughs> I steady it optimism. progress. I was polite. <laughs> steady, probably, st let's just say steady progress. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, only other thing I'd like to say about the, about the SAM uh, report is that uh, the latest flow for uh, yeah. the month of July, uh, the city of Half Moon Bay supplied 66.2% of 
of the flow, we were at 17.7 and Montara was at 16.1. So uh, I think that should mean that we are going to be billed less by SAM for uh, this. And I think the pattern is going to uh, just continue. So um, it may be that-, that Well, we remember, don't, we don't yeah, that'll hit next- so yeah, that'll hit next year, Matthew. That will be right. for next year's budget, yeah. Right. Wow. Okay. Anything else on Sam? Yeah, uh, Yeah. you know, I, I went. they invited me to go to a tour out there. It had been a while since I went. And so uh, so I went on the 23rd of last month. And, um, you know, see, everyone's been there. I think my, my takeaway, though, it was interesting, is I definitely was left with the impression that whoa this place is really in desperate need of resources i mean their their pride and joy is is the uh you know what what was part of the pg e uh you know grant program that they never could have done but because of that uh you know they're able to have so many more efficiencies and that's pretty much the only nice piece of equipment everything else in there is you know past its useful life uh and it's interesting for me to compare, it's so interesting to compare to an agency like GCSD that's just rapidly acquiring buildings and land and all these different things and doing, and then you look at the core function of a sewer district and the processes and we, they are definitely, you know, I was left with the impression, whoa, there's a lot of things these people wanna do that would really help to reduce the sewage and waste going out there but there's just not enough money um, to be able to do all the things they, they think need to be done. And I think it's interesting to contrast that with the growth of these other agencies that have happened. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying their salaries aren't high or nothing else, but just from an infrastructure equipment investment standpoint, I think there's definitely been some negligence that I'm looking at it and going, whoa, you know, how did this happen where, they are in such a position of need and these other agencies are rapidly, you know, spending funds in all these other areas. Um, so that was just kind of a, a point that was, that was interesting. That was kind of my main takeaway that I was left with. You wanna do, answer this? Um, do you want me to? Well, let me just say that um, I think during, you know, some time ago, perhaps the, the 2010, somewhere in that area, the investment that was being made by the board in equipment at SAM was perhaps less than it could have been. But we're now spending $3 million a year. And what you're not seeing, David, is that many of that, the broken down, you know, things that have been there for a long time, they're not broken down. They're working, they're still working fine, but they do look um, rusty and so forth. Slowly but surely, steadily, we're all investing significantly more funds now to the tune of three, $4 million a year to upgrade that plant. And the plans that are in place are going to really go in the next couple of years are going to replace an awful lot of the old uh, pumps and so forth that are there that, you know, they work fine, but they look battered. So, I understand the point you're making, but I, I, I want the community to know that, that the investment is being made and things are being replaced. We're spending money, we're putting in a new um, basin right now. We just replaced all the emitters in that one. We've replaced, and I know the turbochargers, those are really great. And actually when they had this um, upset and they needed to run more um, air through the tanks, they saved a lot of money because they had those those high tech blowers. Uh, lots and lots of upgrades have been made, and many more are on the drawing board to be made, made in the next couple of years. So yeah, yeah. I, yeah. And, and I want to, David, if I could, I want to. Yeah. This is another narrative that gets pushed forth. Yes. And I, I actually think it's a little bit of a. Uh, it's not a true narrative, and it's a bit of a dangerous narrative. Six years ago, Sam's operating budget was three point million. $3.1 million a year. Now it's up to about 5.1, 5.2, plus the $2 million in capital investment that Barbara mentioned. They spend in excess of a, a million dollars a year in professional services and equipment repair and all that kind of stuff. 
since 2010, certainly, no board has failed to pass a SAM budget. So if they're not getting money for things that need to be done, they're not asking for it because every budget has passed from an operational standpoint. So I'm a guy who runs eight treatment plants. Treatment plants are old in different places and newer in different places and you replace motors and pumps and blowers like Barbara said, and that was a nice replacement when they did the blowers, it saved a bunch of energy as I understand it, but it, it is not, the, the narrative that this thing needs $20 million in investment is just false. So. And, and so, yeah. one man, that's just one guy's opinion. I don't run the treatment plant, I'll caveat it, but. Yeah, and, and I think the big caveat is we need to separate the cost of professional services and, and, and payroll and employees and all their other stuff with investment into, infrastructure because yeah, the I think that's a big difference so, in, uh, yeah, yeah i'll be on different sides i think one example which is interesting is the electrical fault problems that we all knew went around you know went on for so long ended up costing them over a million dollars that is the type of decisions that that i see happening at sam always behind the curve when things happen and fines are coming in from agencies all of a sudden everyone says okay yeah time to spend some money but there's not this pride in terms of saying, hey, our 10, 20 year plan, we're all on the same page of where this needs to be. And that's where I see the fragmentation of the boards causing <laughs> lack of focus on the key areas where we need to be focused on. I feel like they were, there's so many opportunities in terms of some of the grants and fundings and other things that, that aren't even being taken advantage of because obviously that's what they're most proud of. I feel like there could be more opportunities there. But I, I just think it's interesting that, uh, that to me, that million dollars over a problem that if everyone would just stepped up and say, spend 100,000 to fix electrical, would have saved 900,000. And that's the type of problems I think you're seeing over and over again. Action isn't being done until everything hits the fan, literally. And, and then, now that's been fixed. David, you're the, the, elect, the electrical failure, you're mischaracterizing uh, the uh, uh, SAM staff did not realize that that uh, structure need, needed to be maintained. There, there were maintenance problems that they had not addressed. When that electric thing finally did just stop working, the board immediately authorized the money to uh, fix it. it. So it's a matter of the board, you know, the board has not turned down any request that uh, has been uh, sent to us and uh, justified, and they and it, we do it right away. And I also want to mention, I totally agree with you and and Director Guy. The place looks really corroded and run down. It, it's rather appalling. Uh, and but another thing that the, that the board has authorized is that as new uh, equipment comes in, they're, they're, it's going to be better protected from the weather and the very salty air. You know, they're like a hundred yards from the from the ocean. And that's what causes a lot of that corrosion. So there are going to be covers and other uh, measures taken that the board has approved and paid for to better protect uh, things when they're replaced. So, but I, 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 I do agree, it, it just looks bad, you know, but it, it, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pride, it's a pride in place thing. And, you know, I've had bunches of different operators and bunches of different programs and some guys have it, some guys don't, but you know, my whispering palms guy, he, he loves to get his motors and pumps and everything sandblasted and painted every three years. And it makes you feel good when you walk in and it's all, <laughs> it's still a sewer treatment plant, but <laughs> it's a shiny sewer treatment plant. So yeah, <laughs> different guys have different things, so. Not shiny, but it's working okay. And we no, are it's shiny. Investing. We use high gloss paint. So <laughs> <laughs> we are investing. Yeah, he actually, and, he actually and, painted um, it light brown, believe it or not. So <laughs> all right, moving on. I don't I don't think tonight we should we don't have no. the <laughs> yeah, information to do a long dive into this. I want the community to know we are making major investments. Yes. We are indeed. Okay. Uh, consent agenda which is item six, August 19th, 2021, special and regular meeting minutes. 
Item seven, September 2021 warrants. Item eight, July 2021 financial statements. And item nine, assessment district distribution number two 21 slash 22. Would anyone like to uh, comment or pull any of those topics for uh, additional discussion? May I have a motion to pass the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Barbara, you seconded? Yep. Okay. Uh, if this is consent, no more discussion. Let's have the roll call, please. Um, Director Dye. Aye. Director Marsh. Aye. Director Clark. Aye. Director Sukamel. Aye. And Director Seaton. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Item 10, committee reports on seminars, conferences, or committee meetings. Do we have any? Seeing none, in the information calendar, item 11, attorney's report. No report. Item 12, general manager's report. Uh, nothing further. Item 13, administrative staff report. Um, I just wanna mention that because of the staging on the Burnham property uh, that we had, we've had a problem with vehicles trying to park on the north side of the property. And I had to put up some uh, little blockades that I dragged out of the pump station the other day and I've been chasing people off. So hopefully that will temporarily keep people out. Um, Director Dye had mentioned uh, having the county place another log uh, to kind of block off that spot. And I was thinking we could probably move one from the other side, you know, that isn't really being used to that side. And it would just be a matter of me getting a, a forklift. Maybe our mower can do that for us. So I, I will be working on that. Excellent. Okay. Delia, and um, yesterday morning, I saw, I can see the northern end of the strip. And uh, I saw a white pickup driving out there. <laughs> I, I, I think it was a Sam truck. But I, oh, okay. But, but I'm not sure because by the time I got out there, it was gone. But okay. I, it, uh, from the way they were driving, they must have gone over the curb to get onto the property. And I, I but I, again, it might have been a Sam truck, but I, I don't know. But uh, we can ask. Yeah. I think I saw. I think that was a Sam truck. I saw that. Yeah. But there, there was a minivan parked out in the middle of the staging area. It was just a guy out running his dog. Yeah, there's been a couple RVs and a couple of different cars, but the, the, the people were really nice. I went out there and approached them and asked them to move and they did. And I, like I said, I've since blocked it off. So I don't foresee any more problems with that right now. I will note that um, they have moved the new odor control system out of Portola over to Princeton pump station. Um, and so, and they're back to the old system, which is why the loud, louder blower is blowing. But the intention is to bring this new high-tech ozone, ozone odor control system back and when they install it later. Because the people on my walk noticed that it had just gone. <laughs> yeah. The odor is uh, significant. Why did they take it over to Princeton? Well, they just had it all deep cleaned. They just did a whole thing there. And I don't know, I think maybe that stirred a bunch of stuff up and so forth, so. Ah. Nancy, I'm sorry, are, are, you, are you saying it was working and it's gone now? No, I'm saying I was surprised at the uh, odor as we walked by, because I thought the vapor thing was there. I got right. disappointed and thought it wasn't working. So I'm actually glad to hear that it had been moved to Princeton and wasn't actually there working. Okay. And no further report. Thank you. Item 14, engineer's report. Um, good news in the engineer's report, and uh, what I'm going to suggest, Matthew, is, that, well, let me, we finished the CIP, so we finished the sewer main replacement uh, project, the first two years of that six-year CIP, so that's good news. Everything went pretty smoothly. Um, the other good news is we finished the Meteor Creek project, so the pipe carrying sewage across the bridge at Meteor Creek is off the bridge, and that's good news to everybody. So what I'm gonna do at our next meeting is I think I'm gonna have separate items on this just to kind of memorialize it and let people know, hey, you know, we've done this good thing. You know, I think it's 
it's a big, they're both of them are big enough projects, it's worthwhile. We won't have a long discussion about it, but at least it'll be in the administrative record of, hey, you know, your board took action to take the sewage off that bridge and send it the other way. So I just want to say, yay, we're, we're yeah. done. <laughs> And, and and I want to say too, John, John Rayner and his his guy X. His name's not really X, but it's a Chinese name no one can pronounce, I guess. So we call him X. They did a great job in prosecuting both those projects. That was good. Yeah, my only issue was that the yard was kind of sloppy, but um, right. they did a really nice job of their work. And now there's going to be some work on the north side of Medio Creek that's going to start shortly. Yeah, so they're they're going to small... repair a, a line that's deteriorated there. Yeah. Can we put a notice on next door and put us something small on the website that explains what's going on? Okay. Yeah. Uh, do, yeah. Does anyone have uh, Delia? Do you do next door? Yes, I can do that. Okay. All right. And you know, with all the PG and E work, they're nowhere near as neat and tidy as our contractors. Work. Right. No, the guys did a good job. John, John was pretty impressed. Yeah, they did a very good job. And, and the same contractor that did the uh, the beach uh, Naples Beach project is going to do the 200 uh, feet of replacement along uh, right in front of the, of the Miramar restaurant. Yeah, and who who was that? It wasn't Devaney. Was it Bell Bell Pacific? No, it was Gold, Golden, Golden Bay. Bay. Golden Bay. Okay. Yeah, which is a local outfit. Okay. Oh, it's 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 on the south side of the creek. North side. Oh, the north side. Okay. I thought someone was saying it was near the Miramar restaurant. No. Just north of the bridge, and it won't won't go all the way up to the restaurant. Actually, I think it just goes to that first street. It's oh, just right, right. I just had segment. it wrong yeah. in my head. My fault. All right. Got it. Okay. Uh, Item 15, future agenda item. Talked about one multiple times. I don't know what I, you know, in the next couple months would be great. Just maybe two months, pick a date and get it on there. Let's list it. Uh, Chuck, we currently have a financing plan for parts is uh, down at number nine, but did it, I hear you say we would have that uh, uh, yeah, meeting? I've been working on that the past month. Yeah. So that was, like I said, ready to go. It just got more complicated than straight up. So. That agenda item was just not how are we, I think you're That's referring a to the, issue. yeah, so it's a, it's a multi-year, multi-layered plan. Yeah. Right. Can we, can we add an item about hybrid meetings in the future? I think it's a important thing for community members who can't come to seven o'clock meetings to be able to call in and access us remotely. Um, I think we've shown that we can do that and it's something we should carry forward. I know the MCC is doing it. I think it would be good for us to do it as well. Yeah, and that's going to be driven, Eric, by the, the governor's um, executive order. And I was actually talking to John Dowdy half of Bay about this. There's some thought that they'll extend these provisions further out, but we'll have to wait and see till uh, September 30th. So we'll know more about that. Yeah, but we can add that definitely. Yeah. It's got signed through, it's, it's extended to January 1st. I, I saw that was the proposal. I don't know that I saw that signed, but I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Bill, you got any? An announcement that it was signed today. Okay. Oh, oh, I oh, today? Well, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know it was signed today. Yeah. Okay. But I, but I do think that Eric's bringing up a slightly different point, which is not necessarily board member remote. Yeah, I'm thinking about, I mean, the board member thing is separate and I have my opinions about that, but I, I think from a, an access and just public, public participation point of view, I think, I think having a hybrid option is something we should be thinking hard about. Like, I mean, I think back to the purchase of the Picasso property 
many of those people who came and talked probably would not have been able to like come to an in-person meeting, irrespective of the pandemic. Okay. So something like if we do meet in person, we'll need to put some kind of monitor, if you will. Yeah, and I, I know Dave, Dave Wilson has thought about this quite a bit for the MCC, I think. So, I mean, maybe Delia can reach out to Dave and see see what they're thinking about doing. Yeah, okay. I mean, we could also have specific host TV of what it would take for them to just, their cameraman could be responsible for, you know, handling the, you know, running that, making sure that connects and seeing what, if there's extra fee or whatever. Okay. Yeah, we've got a, yeah, and if they can't, we've got a high tech system that, that do that conference room that so high tech I can't use it, but <laughs> the, pe the people smarter than me seem to do it quite successfully. It's got a couple big screens with a camera and speakers and all that, so. So that means that uh, like if you had TV there recording it, it would be visible in the TV screen and the board would be next to it or behind it or in front of it or something. And yeah, yeah. That sounds pretty ideal. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? I am adjourning the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Who's available for signatures tomorrow?